Great. Um, well, welcome everybody. To our August Transportation Committee mm -hmm. meeting. Um, we will start the meeting by uh, being attendance. Roger. Here. Steve. Here. Portia. Here. Craig. Here. Tuck. Here. Peter. Here. Uh, John Anderson is not available to join us tonight, and I'm Jen. Here. Super. Um, the next item is the approval of meeting minutes from the June 25th meeting. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions or edits? I thought we did have public comment after that meeting. We did. Well, it says no no comments were made, but I thought for sure we had public comment. One for all the Is that the last meeting or the meeting before? It was the last, was last meeting. June? Yeah. June. Yeah, we had the people here about the. Um, well, we had it in connected. here, but yeah. then, but even when we, because the one June was when we were in public assembly, not that or not. We didn't have July because it got canceled last week. Right. But I'm I'm thinking we had public comment that day. Yeah. I can double check if you yeah, have the like, oh, yeah. Eric wrote these for me after the meeting, so we watched the video. So okay, we okay. Well, then they captured it, but I don't honestly remember. Yeah, there wasn't, but oh, sweet. Sweet. I, I, thought you actually I know we had a public comment when we met here. Yeah, yeah. We spoke about the uh, Grom connector. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I can double check here. And that was the only thing that triggered for me. I thought I thought we had public comment. Oh no! Actually, the last meeting, Peter, you were at the last one. Were you here with the um, when the people, the public, was here? I no, I don't think I was. I think that was the main meeting. I think I, right. I wasn't at the main meeting. I was at the last one. I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, okay. the last. I don't remember there being public comments at the last meeting, but I could be wrong. I'd go back and check the recording, but um, okay. but uh, Good. yeah, the last one. You guys make a motion. I'll go back and double check and let you know. Next <clears> time. <throat> I think we were wrong. Well, I'll move to uh, approve the minutes. Okay. It's written. Okay. Um, let's take the vote. Roger? Yes. Steve? Yes. Portia? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Craig? Yes. Uh, I vote yes also. Peter? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is uh, item number three, Safe Streets for All grant presentation from Cashel Stewart at GP Pod. Hey, Cashel, I'm going to promote you to a panelist. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear Hi, me? Hi, how are you? <clears throat> uh, forgive me for being on Zoom, but it was fun watching you all uh, on mute, laughing and conversing. I feel like I knew. <laughs> um, we're talking about chocolate, so. <laughs> were you? Okay. That explains the, the laughing. Which you would um, have some of if you were here. <laughs> some cho Norwegian chocolate. I should be there. I should be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, so should I dive right in? Are we good? Yeah, sure. go ahead. Great. Please. Um, so let me share a screen. Great. Um, so just to introduce myself briefly, uh, I am a regional transportation planner for GPCOG or the Greater Portland Council of Governments. And I am managing this Safe Streets for All grant um, on behalf of GPCOG. There will be a number of GPCOG staff working on the project over the years, um, but I will be managing it. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you all about it. Um, I will say this is 
largely an FYI, um, and there's definitely more to come, um, you know, between GBCOG and this committee to, to provide input on um, on the project itself. Um, but glad to be here just to introduce it, the idea. So for those of you who don't know, the Safe Streets for All grant stemmed from the bipartisan infrastructure law, which allocated $5 billion over five years um, for this program. Um, it is almost exclusively for plans and projects that prevent roadway deaths and serious injuries. Um, we've sort of dubbed that in the region as Vision Zero, and um, many, many others have as well. Um, so that's pretty much what, um, but what all these grants are going um, are are being applied for within the guise of and um, and the the chief goal of all of them are um, they do they break up the two the the grant into two uh, types of projects planning and demonstration projects and then implementation projects um, we've only gone for planning and demonstration projects so far as a region uh, but the first one was used to develop a vision zero action plan. And that was uh, back in 2022. And uh, that action plan has since been passed, uh, passed in 2023. Um, and very shortly after, uh, the GPCOG went for a supplemental planning and demonstration grant, which they also received. And um, that's what we're talking about today, that second one. Um, we're also receiving word from some other communities in the region that um, they're going after these um, planning and demonstration grants as well. Um, again, no one's gone after an implementation grant, but um, know that Scarborough is, you know, always um, open um, and available to apply for this grant um, because the Vision Zero Action Plan covers the entire region. Um, that was the main prerequisite uh, for the grant. So we, we applied for this grant and um, sort of on behalf of a number of communities and we received six hundred thirty six thousand dollars and are leveraging a 20 percent match um most of that is coming from in-kind support from bicycle coalition of maine portland trails gp cog and uh, the communities themselves and the staff um, roughly half of that money is going towards planning studies and half that money is going towards demonstration projects all of the projects and I'm forgetting how many subprojects we broke it into. It's like maybe 17 or something um, are, are going to happen over a four year span starting this year and ending in 2027. And we have projects in six separate communities, uh, although I will say primarily Saco, Scarborough, South Portland and Portland. Uh, there's just one in Biddeford and Westbrook. So just to go over where the other studies um, are happening uh, and, and where Scarborough fits into it. Um, we've gr grouped the studies, alluded to like there's 17 sub-projects, but um, there's seven planning studies and um, they're broken up into three road safety audits that are happening in South Portland. Um, there are corridor studies that are going to look at safety. Um, then three intersection analyses uh, in Portland, South Portland, and Scarborough. Um, and you see there Scarborough's location is at Route 1 and, and Sawyer. Um, and then the third thing is a regional roundabout screening study that we have yet to scope out, but will essentially look at the feasibility of adding roundabouts at a lot of our, our worst crash locations, our, our highest risk locations. And then the demonstration projects are broken up into nine projects over three years, so three groupings of three projects. Um, and uh, you can see we've we've tried to do three in each year to uh, you know make it as uh, balanced as we could. And we also balanced the um, the sort of this the anticipated scope or, or headache some of these will do. Um, as you'd imagine, doing a demonstration project on Route one is is going to be pretty tough um, compared to, say, Saco uh, Main Street. Um, just a lot more traffic moving through there on any given day and faster speeds and, and all that. Um, so we'll, we'll get more into that in a second. Um, but yeah, there's, there's the rest of the, the groupings. Um, and we're, we're kicking off, uh, later this fall, we'll start looking at next year's projects for, um, construction in 2025. 
So the first Scarborough project is uh, an intersection analysis at Route 1 and Sawyer Road. And um, we're pretty much kicking it off right now, uh, both with some light engagement, uh, me being here today, of course, but um, but really hiring a consultant to, to do the work is the first step. Um, so we've um, started that process and um, it should take about 10 months. Um, we'll we'll see, uh, but that's what we're, we're aiming for. Um, and the main need here uh, is, is pedestrian safety. And, um, you know, just by looking there, and I'm sure your lived experience, um, there's no crosswalk crossing Route 1 here. Um, there's also no crosswalk um, on the south side, on the Bessie School Drive side. Um, and I don't think there's a marked crosswalk on the top either. Um, and certainly a, a long crossing distance for pedestrians there. Um, part of this stems as well from um, the Memorial Park access to the north uh, for the school and the retirement and elderly communities, um, Bessie Commons and, and, um, and the Bessie Crossing. Um, one of those might just be apartments and not fully caught up. Um, and um, my understanding is as well as that public safety apparatus like fire trucks and stuff come out Sawyer Road. So balancing that need um, and then this intersection analysis will also look at the, the need of the slip lane um, on the southwest corner there. Um, the scope itself will be planning and preliminary design with the goal of getting to about a 25% design uh, with the consultant. Um, that a draft design will be circulated in roughly early, early spring 2025. Um, so that's the sort of main touch point, um, you know, I, I definitely welcome any input that uh, you have now um, to help inform the early stages. Um, the early stages with the consultant will be mostly gathering data, uh, collecting new data if there are gaps and, um, and getting the full picture of the intersection and all its many issues. Uh, you know, I met with Scarborough staff about three weeks ago, and we talked through the many challenges and uh, staff made it very clear that um, sort of know what the challenges are, know the direction um, the community wants to head with the intersection. And so we sort of shifted the scope to get closer to a, um, a design deliverable that could be used uh, to pretty much immediately go after funding uh, via DOT or discretionary funds uh, for final design and, and construction. Um, so that's great. You know, the sort of other thing would be more of a planning study to assess what the issues are, um, which we are doing at some other intersections. Um, but this is, uh, definitely a little further along. Peter, I'm happy to take your question now if you want. Yeah. And it might be for you, Cashel, or it might be for Autumn. Um, sure. the, all the things that you described about this intersection are also common with the municipal campus intersection, just about probably a few hundred yards up the street. Um, yeah. There some is part of this um, a sort of involve engage a, um, uh, a, a a correlation or or relationship um, analysis of those two different intersections, or is that beyond the scope of this? Um, it's not the scope that we came up with, um, although it's a, it's a very interesting question. And Autumn, maybe I'll I'll let you jump in in a second. Um, we definitely have limited funds for this. So looking at both intersections would be out of the question. Um, we'd probably have to shift to doing more of a planning study that doesn't get to full design um, just because it's more of a, okay, what is the picture here? How do they interact with each other? Um, what are the movements and that sort of thing? And I think um, that would take a lot of the time and money away and would preclude us from getting to a design deliverable that we that's more actionable, which is what I heard from Scarborough yeah. staff. So Autumn, please, if you have. I was just going to say Municipal Drive does have crosswalks and the new um, crossing buttons and everything installed. So. Um, no, and I'm not thinking about a, a sort of a design. It's just that the, if you, the, a lot of the same traffic has the option of using either intersection. Vehicular um, traffic, got it, yeah. Well, and, and to a certain extent, um, pedestrian traffic, when you bring into the, the, the Memorial Park access and other things, um, and I'm just, and again, I, I understand that, that there's a limited funding need and, and this is just about this access and also the municipal campus 
access is a much newer intersection and there was a, a lot of work done on that already. It's more, can we take the work that was done on municipal campus and maybe use that as a data feed for this um, to help feed cash to your work from an initial perspective and then maybe have that as an ongoing analysis project where we're just keeping our eye on sort of the un unintended or unforeseen consequences of improving Route 1 Sawyer Road and seeing how that feeds out to the other intersections that handle much the same traffic. Okay. Um, so, no, and I don't want to change the scope of this. I think this is great. Yeah, I, yeah, totally. Um, and I, I think it's a, I mean, it's a great idea to use, um, you know, successes and um, ongoing data collection, both qualitative and quantitative, coming from Municipal Drive to to inform this and what we want to do. What what isn't working in Municipal Drive? You know, make sure you don't repeat it. Um, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's a great comment, and I, I think you'll the sort of theme of um, of uh, this presentation and and also um, a lot of the projects GPCOG is working on is looking at Route 1 as a whole and how every intersection <laughs> uh, looks along Route 1 and how um, how to in some in some ways consolidate you know maybe you don't want um, a crossing at every intersection in some scenarios um, you know I, I would think this stretch along Scarborough, you're gonna find a lot of similarities with each intersection, um, be able to borrow a lot of the things you're learning. Um, so it's actually a good segue um, into the demonstration. We have, we have one question in the room here. Oh, sure, go ahead, sorry. I just wondered how this ties into the work that Downs was gonna be doing on Route 1. Like if they plan to do certain improvements and then they're gonna come back and... I believe, all of the improvements in this area have been finished except for Oak Hill. Okay. So I think they put in the sidewalk and they did the extension and work on uh, commerce. Okay. That came to their And will this address the fact that there's no sidewalk on the Bessie Commons side? I don't know. Cashel, I, we've talked, when we talked, we were really interested in doing something a little different with that slip lane too, because it is sort of right, wasted. Right. Well, and he's, yeah, but, but no there's sidewalk. no sidewalk there's on no that sidewalk. side, and I see the the folks walking from there a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, as we look at this intersection, um, we can definitely, um, you know, work with the consultants and um, look at the entire intersection, not just, you know, the where the turning movements are happening, but go out a hundred yards in every direction and. Um, you know, look at where sidewalks are petering out or uh, are not present at all, like that southwest corner, um, and either incorporate the, that into our designs. Um, and again, there's no construction as part of this project, um, but the designs could, you know, have a sidewalk heading that direction. And you, you know, you could pair that with other funding to have a more complete sidewalk um, through there. Um, I, I'd, I'd say it's all on the table and it'll all be part of scoping with staff and the consultant and um, GP COG um, when the time comes. And, and bike lane or bike, um, bike definitely access. Will be, definitely will be a consideration. Yes, absolutely. Um, how, how bikes are moving through here. Okay. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. How does this tie in with the group one study that was done? Uh, do you mean the complete street study that was done in 2019? One that uh, T.Y. Lynn did a few years ago. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. That's, that's the one. one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is kind of a direct result of that. Um, as GP Cog finished up the Vision Zero Action Plan, we had a long list of where the worst corridors are and intersections are from a safety standpoint and um, talked with all the communities where those intersections and corridors were present and so uh, worked with them to select a list um, of, of highest priorities um, that they'd like to see. So, um, you know, that list was definitely stemmed from talking with staff and um, and came from that Complete Streets Corridor study um, that, that T.Y. Lynn did. You'll see from the demo project, I actually pulled some screenshots from um, that study uh, because um, same thing, you know, locations were, were borrowed from that. Um, and you did mention the downs as well when we when we met with staff a few weeks ago. Um, uh, I was ignorant and had a couple of intersections that had already been done in the last year by downs. So um, you know we hashed out what's being done, what's going to be done, 
what's on the horizon and uh, what we wanted to keep in the project um, okay. and what we could okay. add because we had replacements. Um, the other question I have is, um, well, one thing I hear from the public is that there's too many signals already on rule one, and I understand the need for them, but it, it could could possibly the outcome of this be no crosswalk right there and encourage people just to go up to um, the, you know, the um, um, municipal campus crosswalk? We have no sidewalks and it's only with people. Sorry, what was your question? There's, I, I got pulled away for a second of, there. Of, of your study be basically no crosswalk right there, but just basically it, com completely on the there. table, completely on the table. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I mean, this is going to look at everything, all the all the many needs of this intersection, and it um, it may decide that a crosswalk um, doesn't make sense here. It's not safe. Um, there's another option two hundred yards away. Um, that that could be an outcome here. Um, that's sort of the point of the intersection analysis is to um, look at every option here. I don't think it's going to look at signals, though. I will say that. Well, I know Angela has mentioned a number of times that you don't want to have stop signs or signals too too often because they sort of defeat their purpose. But here you've got elderly people. I mean, you know, I, sat I, at that intersection and watched them. The lights haven't even allowed them sometimes to make it all the way across. So asking them to go further up the road with no sidewalks is probably not on the table. Well, and the great <clears> thing <throat> about this, because of that slip lane, we have some extra room to do something maybe interesting in the middle. Um, so, yeah. Some kind of meeting. Mm -hmm. Peter's got his hand. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, but be polite on that. I noticed that there's a cutoff about maybe 50 yards down on Sawyer Road, but the is there any examination of, of the extension of the sidewalk there? Because that is kind of leading into um, the, uh, the 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 park and 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 ultimately into the the, the municipal campus infrastructure. Um, yeah. I, I, and I'm just wondering, maybe that's already uh, sort of on the boards for the town, Autumn. So there's no need to include this in the scope of the grant project. But just a question. Any thoughts, Autumn? I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. Can oh, I think I was, walk to Memorial? I think yeah, that would be point and drive. To, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was distracted by Roger. Um, <laughs> ask me the question again. So the cutoff for the grant area looks like it's about 50 yards down Sawyer Road. Um, yeah. But the the, the the sidewalk cuts off there and clearly part of the this intersection's value is to funnel pedestrians and bikers into the part the memorial park and 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 the, the the quiet areas within sawyer road is there already a, a a town scope idea to improve those pedestrian thoroughfares on on sawyer road or would those also be a part of the scope of this project we don't have anything that I'm aware of other than we know it should be done, but we don't have any plans and works for it, Peter. Yeah. So yeah, if it comes up as part of this, then I think we'd probably just bridge the gap between it. Got it. Because to 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 rate um to uh Porsche's point, um, you know, you've got elderly folks who would be otherwise using this to cross Route One, but they cross Route One in dead end. Right. Um, so it's it becomes a it would become a challenging um a temptation point for them. It, it's a great observation. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, because this is an intersection analysis, limited funds, I, we're probably going to extend about 50 to 100 yards in every direction to get the full picture. But at some point, it's got to stop. And if you're going to keep a um, sort of tight scope for the design with the amount of money that we have, um, you know, we yep. can get a design for that. Um, it is sort of piecemeal. It'd be great to line something up to do that other project and get us up to Memorial uh, Park there. Um, but yeah, it's not something that sounds like is on Autumn's uh, list there yet anyway. Well, they're all on our list. We just don't have any money. <laughs> no. Fair enough. Fair it'll enough. We'll move it. You know, if we have this in place, it would move it to the list, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
totally. We're, we're, our, activity. our next item, we're talking about our town-wide transportation plan. So we have a whole slew of areas we need to improve for pedestrians and bikes. So yeah. Some depends. We just put it in the queue. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great. I definitely made note of that, though. All right, I'm going to move on to the demonstration project. Um, so definitely note the timeline here. We're we're quite a bit out, um, well over a year, until we even uh, group together to talk about the scope um, and finalize that. Um, so this will essentially be a, a summer 2026 demonstration project that goes in for the summer um, demonstration projects. If you're not familiar, are um, temporary installations using low cost materials. I actually list a couple there in the scope, um, paint, flex posts, rubber curbing, planters, that sort of thing to test out an infrastructure improvement. Um, and uh, we'll be doing a number of them along route one. Um, and the ones listed there are temporary list that um tentative list i should say um that we came up with in our meeting um again the scarborough downs stuff has changed things a bit um but a number of these are from the ty island study in 2019 the complete street study um so yeah the main need here again is pedestrian safety um crossings enhanced good crossings um and median islands for the long crossing distance across route one and then general route one safety through um, traffic calming measures uh, like medians and um, curb management uh, was also a sort of big highlight from um, that complete streets plan. A um, lot of turns in and out um, and um, medians prohibiting those left hand turns. Um, and of course, it's Scarborough's most urban area. Um, so there's a lot going on, a lot of um, moving pieces. Um, so yeah, for crossings, um, we had three uh, that we came up with. Um, one of them is at Sawyer Road. And so the idea here is um, study the intersection. Um, then we can test something out the year after um, while we go after um, you know, a more significant amount of money. Um, that's one idea. Um, then a mid-block crossing between Little Dolphin and Foxcroft. Another option is to do um, a crossing at one of those intersections as well. Um, and then Hannaford Drive was brought up um, in that meeting as a significant need. Six lanes, I think it is, through there. Um, and a, a bus stop as well, popular one. Um, and then also mentioned is in, enhanced existing crosswalks. Um, so obviously we've been uh bit by bit going after each crosswalk and um you know trying to put them in and um they are striped but throughout the winter season they fade and become less effective that sort of thing there are, there are other ways to enhance those crosswalks to um you know draw motorists attention to pedestrians uh uh shorten the crossing distance for pedestrians, that sort of thing. Um, and then median islands were brought up as well. And I actually I think one of these might've been put in, um, but Sawyer Road to Municipal Drive, Municipal Drive to Gorham Road and then Gorham Road to Hannaford Drive. Um, I actually have a photo of one of them. I think this is the one that's in. Is this in or no? Yes. Uh, yeah. That's it, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this one's been done. So maybe maybe um, disregard that one. Um, we're not going to do it again. But um, something like this um, that uh, prohibits dangerous left turns in places where they shouldn't be happening, um, slows people down a bit, um, and um, that sort of thing. And uh, if this one's already been done, then we can do a different section. Um, another option with medians is to do um, yeah, it's, it's just painted. I'm like, painted. I drive that every day. I think it's just painted. Just not painted? Not okay. Painted. All right. Yeah, it's just raised. Okay. I mean, not um, raised. It's just painted. That's well, so, you know, the demonstration can help take one more step and add um, flex posts or planters or rubber curbing or something that really discourages people because paint gets you one step, but not all the way. Um, 
uh, that was one idea. And then here's just another screenshot from that complete street study. Um, you don't need to study this, uh, but it has where all the uh, pedestrian uh, facilities are in this particular stretch. And uh, the green crossings in here um, are the ones that um, this study identified as, as should be added. Um, and I believe the crosswalk at Ward Street has been added. Um, yeah, so you're going to put it in Van Gorm Road. What's that? Maybe in Van Gorm. No, no, but there's so a that, short one by there. Yeah, right there. You, you want to run the whole length? I, I, I think this was to be. Isn't DOT putting a median? Like no, no, no up, up, up to well, the last up to the intersection, and yeah. then on Black Point Road also. That was the was route. One. It was on Route One from Gorm Road. Yeah. yeah. To, well, I know no, there's a short the one. Yeah, there's a short one to the library. Just, like, if, well, that yeah, one. But I thought they were talking from Oak Hill all oh. the way down. They want to put it on, like, I'll cut off all the access to Oak Hill. I thought DOT was kind of has plans for that on Black Point Road short, as well as Glow Road. For the short right. distance, right up to Oak well, Route 1. Well, just a short distance, though, like from the Walgreens exit. You can't wouldn't be able to come out of the I call that song. I don't know what it is kind of, but so oh, the certain state finish. Oh, never. Right. Well, the slide you showed before, though, what it it had a. But that was on my uh, Bessie. That was on my at um, Sawyer. I just thought it said, Gorm Road from Route One to Annaford. It's a slide previous to this. Oh, can you yeah. go back a slide, Kathy? I didn't say Gorm. Yeah. This. No, one no, more. One more. Oh, sorry. Yep. There we go. Gorm Road to Hannaford, Median Islands. So what's I think that that's mean? on Route One. Okay. Like yeah. across the McDonald's. Stretch, yeah. Like that that stretch between okay. between those two lights. That's that's how I interpreted it because I know that the I look, the look is just on Route One. Yeah. Everything's Route One. Yep. Okay. Got it. But yes, uh, actually, that is a good point because Hanford Hanford Drive does intersect. With Gorm Road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There'll be a map someday of that. Okay. That'll, that'll really help us out. Just worry about making my friends out. All good. This is why I gotta be there in person. Cause... All good. We're okay. good. All right. Um all right. Now, the last few things I want to mention about this are the key input periods. So things to be aware of. Again, really, really far out here, but uh, it's about a year long process um about four months from let's say december 2025 to march 2026 where we're uh drafting the demo designs we're looking at all the different options um and then we'll circulate those around to the committee and get input there's a dog on the screen I'm sorry they focus people come on just kidding <laughs> um and uh, then it'll go in in the summer of 2026, and it'll be an ongoing monitoring period, uh, both of qualitative and quantitative data assessment, um, you know, probably sur surveys, um, how's it going, what do you like about it, what don't you like about it, um, and quantitatively collecting data, traffic counts, um, certainly crash data, um, and then development of a report in fall of 2026. And that report is the, the key deliverable um, that essentially describes the effectiveness of the facilities. Um, and that can be used to justify keeping the facilities. FHWA actually doesn't have a requirement for removing them. So you can just keep them if you like them um, or removing them if they're not working and um, building off any successful facilities by seeking funding. For a permanent solution. Yeah, so that's the goal of that. Um, Can I ask you a question? When you sure. talk about the goal of summer of 2026, are you talking about that's when the demo would be a deliverable? Because our higher crashes are in the summer with a lot of... Um, yeah, it'll, all that data will be compared to comparable data. So it'll be the same month um, and similar conditions on the road, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, definitely. I, can I ask uh, a process question? Before this actually goes into effect, will there be discussions within the community, say at the town council level or something like that, so the public is aware, or do you just 
all of a sudden on flash, a Monday morning there's flash mob. <laughs> um the, it's gonna be a, a, a tremendous part of this is getting um buy-in in the designs and alerting people of the changes so that it's safe day one. Um, and that'll involve uh I mean from the very get-go, hey, does every um, you know, city staff department, um, city department comfortable with this? We're talking, you know transit and fire trucks and police cars and you know are are they all on board um and then you know that first one there draft demo design circulated so that'll be out in the public I, I reckon I'll come to this committee um maybe even a council meeting getting input on the designs um so that people's voices can be heard um, and, and incorporated into um the designs themselves um and then you know, like week of when it's being installed, we'll work with the PD to um, make sure it's done safely, probably done actually installed at, you know, overnight or something. Um, I worked with Jen actually um, back in our Portland days, um, public works, and um, we did the Park Ave separated bike lane facility, um, which was <laughs> all done overnight and painted overnight. Um, and part of it, hand painted by yours truly um so um some you know sometimes that's the only way it can be done because route one is truly that busy um we wouldn't be froggering across the street to put it in um, it was it was the paint was all put down at night yeah when the road closed yeah but we had to do like parking prohibitions overnight and yeah that was, that was a lot no on street parking on route one, casual. <laughs> Thanks, thank, thank the Lord. Love it. Great. Are there any other questions on this? Thank you very much for um this overview. It's really helpful. Yeah, you bet. And and more to come. I mean, it, it's definitely I'm I'm glad to have a relationship with you all to get more input as things progress. Um, but I, I believe autumn will probably be your um point on this if you have um more specific questions so no i should be angela yeah. angela okay i'm feeling in for angela <laughs> i'm sure she'd uh yeah. she'd say you but all right this is this will be her baby okay all right thank you yeah okay, you bet all right bye um Okay, our next item is um, item four, review of the draft townwide transportation study, um, which we now have a draft of. Well, this is the draft of section two. Okay. So the bicycle and pedestrian mobility, safety, connectivity. The final draft is due back to us uh, for the whole thing, September 13th. Okay. In our office, so then we'll bring it back to you. But this is the, I believe the last section. We've gone through the different sections and been submitting our comments. So let me get this open. Oh, did you distribute this ahead of time? Or is this effectively the section two we had for the last meeting that we reviewed? No, Angela sent it out with the agenda, uh, agenda packet. Yeah, it's in that I, email. I did not get that attachment. Um, I did get the agenda packet, but I didn't get the attachment for the section two. Yeah, um, I thought it was all one email. There were four attachments. Yeah, I saw them. Together. Minutes yeah. agenda and these, there's an appendix. This is the one with the maps and everything, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let me uh, bring it up. It should have been in that meeting of uh, that email she sent Wednesday, yeah. Thursday last week. Okay, no, I got it. I got it. I was looking at the wrong email. Um, the 22nd. Yeah, okay, I've got it. Sorry about that. It's not the truth, yeah. Number one, it's like 98 pages or something like that. So this is it. Um, and we can go through it however you guys want to. Um, just comment away, whatever works for you guys. 
they went through um the beginning is a lot of just sort of background information um, existing conditions existing um speed limits that sort of thing um crash data the dark green, I'm going to ask him to change the colors because the dark green and the light green is really hard to see. <laughs> I couldn't even see it on my print. I see it better on screen at least. Um, Talk about the dots. The dot, yeah. Yeah. right. Um, I found that this whole section was very bicycle heavy, which is good, but I didn't find a lot of pedestrian information except when you get to the recommendations. So I have some general comments on that. Um, they, there's your average daily traffic volumes. I either need this to be organized by the biggest or alphabetical or something, mm -hmm. because this is, it's all, of, it's all over the place. So I mean, it wants me. Um, the other one, Andrew, uh, on that one, is there, that's a point wise information. Is there, have these been steady trends? Are all these growing equally? at all intersections or are we seeing the emergence of high volume areas that in, in other areas are remaining relatively constant? Having a point in time analysis was kind of hard. That's a good um, comment, Peter. I'll ask them if they can give us some sort of- Yeah, and and at the very least stating when this data was from right. yeah. five years from now, if someone grabs this page out of this document, we know what- Is know, it is real? AADT or... yeah, and so 2023. Well, it's like right. Penny Road pre-Costco or after Costco. Right, right. Exactly. When is it? Exactly. exactly. Or if it yeah. was like 2021 when we had, when it was a COVID year, it's like, uh, that might not be as helpful as seeing other years. So yeah, it, having some more background as to, to the point in time analysis and whether we can get some trend would be great. A month, yes. Yes. For sure, yeah. yeah. I wonder if they could even add a column to this that's just like a, an up arrow or a down arrow. That's, that's a good like thing. over the last five years, we've we've seen seen this number is the trend. up or this number is down. Yeah. Um, and that way it's still sort of like quick and mm -hmm digestible without being, you know, an, an exponential um, spreadsheet, maybe like that, maybe that, that yeah, go like in the that. back or something like that. But that would let you know that, yes, these are high volume areas and they continue to grow yeah. um, or or vice versa. I think that's don't a great you, Don't comment. you think most of these would be increasing all the time? I think you would be very surprised that not all of them are continuously um where some would be like I, I could see uh, Muzzy Road and Corn Road and Spring Street with the hotels and the apartments yeah. there. That's going to become a major right uh, yep. area there, and the way the streets are designed and everything. Yeah, as well as further on Payne Road, you know, with yep. the not the hotels going there and the alleged coffee shop. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, let's see. And then we get into the mapping for that. And there's an existing sidewalk exhibit that I just really struggle with. It's really uh, that it's not the all color. I'm surprised you could find one. I, I think <laughs> it's this dark gray line, but um, I put that I can't read it. I wanted to know the number of miles. I'd like it to you know the number of miles of roadway that we have and the number of miles of sidewalk we, that we have. I think that'll be important as we yep. plan to increase sidewalk for maintenance and everything. Maybe. Just some basic information, like the pedestrian information was missing for me. And also, you know, I, obviously they're trying to show the whole, you know, the limit of the whole town here, but mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know- so Like this map, here we go. You could- we you talked to them about doing, doing the, four pieces. Yeah, like kind of breaking it out. Yeah, in a way. we had at that that mm -hmm. public meeting. Yeah, we're broken. So you can yeah, actually yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this is TY. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of information. Yeah. On all these maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we have um, existing bicycle lanes and shoulders. And I found it later on, but I sometimes struggle with, does the definition come first or like, what is a suitable width? Mm -hmm. And so I found it in the end. So maybe I just feel like they should acknowledge it everywhere. 
Yeah. Because I don't know. Well, also well, just five, five, five feet, feet, six is ideal. It should be five feet, six is ideal. Um, most of them. I just wanted some. Feet. I just wanted some context for these. Really, you know, like what's a wide right. shoulder? Yeah, well, I was say that what's too. literally a shoulder? Like, <laughs> yeah. The title of the graphic is the shoulder width. And I don't but know what the width is. The width and so I wanted to know what this stuff meant. Yeah. So that was my comment on this one. Ah, uh, yeah. That would be helpful. Even if it was a range, like wide yeah. shoulder and six plus. Well, or something like, like that. Like on Route One there in front of Bessie, you know, you've got a fairly wide uh, shoulder that you can use. And suddenly it yeah. gets up to um, Carpenter right Car Browns and it's gone. Yeah. I mean, it's, oops, it just disappears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So then we move on to a whole lot of information about bicycle stress level. Yeah. Um, and it was how that's defined. And then a lot of stuff I didn't really go through in detail, but I looked at the map that showed where the stress level was. Um, I don't know, is this stuff better suited for an appendix. I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> All the stuff that I feel like, I don't want to read it, and I'm kind of like a nerd about yeah. stuff it, like this, looks like an appendix to me. It's interesting too, I was, if I got a cotton rain the other day, I was come back from Wyndham, end up on 302, has a really, really wide shoulder, but the stress level is, yeah. you know, it's not necessarily conducive to, it's not always related to the shoulder width. The stress level. I just saw a great table. I have to dig back in my mind to this see if I can remember where I found it, but it was basically comparing um, what an uh, appropriate or a comfortable mm -hmm. slash safe uh, shoulder or bike lane width would be given um, speed, AADT, and speed. Blue. I don't Got know it. if you recall that at all. Mm -hmm. But um that was very eye-opening to me. I was reading it in a in a context completely separate from this, but it it reminded me very much of Route One in Scarborough because we have high speeds and high um traffic volumes, and that resource would would then indicate a, a shoulder, an appropriate shoulder width of 10 feet or more, or something like mm -hmm. that. Much, Not much more than five or than six your normal feet. five yeah. feet. So yeah. I think something like that is you know is important. And I and I believe that this is what that end is what this is sort of getting at. Um it was just a very easy to is it also understand. related to not only speed but also whether there is a lane separation oh yeah kind certainly of, a buff like no, sort some of some kind of a buffer whether it's volumes or yeah something for, i but, i seem to recall the one that i was looking at was directly like for shoulder width which i interpret to be very different than even a bike lane yeah, or a separated yeah, right. facility shoulder width is more like two feet you're or, just right next yeah, to you know what you guys do like in portland on washington going outbound we yep. have there's a bike lane, but it's not just a single line, it's that double line yep. with like a foot or two yep. in between. And visually, like you don't have bollards or anything, but it, I feel safer as a biker yep. with the double line space. than they, they actually show that in one of these. Yeah. Yeah. But you you know, when you're talking stress level, especially on bike uh, walking, when you're on streets where the white line on the edge of the street is right where the dirt is, that's stress when you're yep. trying to yes. walk. Pain. No, when <laughs> someone's trying to walk a dog or uh, ride a bike, I mean, it's mm -hmm. after. I mean, I, I see people. I, I keep coming back to Fog Road all the time, and that is yeah. such a dangerous road because there's no place for anybody to go other than just a vehicle. Right. And uh, and I'm sure there's many other roads in in Scarborough. And I would think oh, if you just gave people two feet they would think that is great <laughs> well look at look at pain road where it goes underneath the bridge at the brook here's the, yeah, yeah i mean you're walking you're done yeah. you either got a levitate you're there or you're like <laughs> man do it a lower we can put the yeah. hand holds up yeah. yeah i mean the path goes and then it kind of goes oh how am i going to get this <laughs> run, run. <laughs> yeah so, all right yeah, so then they get fun. into the bicycle origin and destination demand. Um, 
I had a huge question about where they got this data. Peter, I share that question because I know where it came from. <laughs> and um, you should definitely be asking about the validity of this information, specifically for bikes <clears throat> and pets. And there may be, um, that may be different. Streetlights um, data pulling for active transportation uses may be different from what I was familiar with, but my understanding is not that long ago. This would not. I would really question whether it would be um, something suitable to yes. suitable use. Yeah. Because of my understanding is it came from cars, um, connected vehicles. So, okay. Well, and I'm not even really sure if this is helpful because yeah, yeah, it, these it are our destinations because that's where you go and start. It doesn't really break it down. It like, doesn't. Really. It doesn't break it down very small. It's kind of those areas that are large, and like that's kind of logical. So yeah, I'm not because we have our other key origins and destination maps. So I just felt like this was kind of filler. Yeah. Probably the reason we don't have the rough from uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit is it has to right? <laughs> So then we get into uh, the traffic calming toolbox. They had a really, they had used all of, um, what is it, Yarmouth that has a really good one? Uh, yes. They had used that. And we asked them to take that out because we're doing that with another project. So they just made it a little bit more generic. Yeah. And then referenced our crosswalk installation policy. Uh, and then they get into improvements and destinations from our open house meeting. Yeah, if I was got the feeling this was a uh, cut and paste operation. It yeah. Um because well anything with this fine too. But looking at the open house, I mean, we had people who came and gave us very specific oh, yeah. information. Yeah. But those were interested people, too. So. Sure. So this is just like information captured, really. And then, then they get into this map that they created from that meeting. Uh, and this is helpful. It talks about really where people are going. Um, but it doesn't show going to the beaches. That's what I use. Uh, it does have the parks. It's like designated as destinations. So it's a green dot. They're yeah. not really weighted, though. How would we understand, like, you know, that 20 people didn't put their dot on Ferry Beach and only one on Fuller Farm, you know? Well, that, that dot would probably snap must be to Black Point in for dinner. <laughs> Well, I just think important <laughs> to kind of understand, you yeah, know, the weightedness. Of, yeah, you know, yeah. because we ended up with a lot of dots in a couple of places, right? And then one or two, one or two, even if, even if they like, were um, scaled, like the circles could be scaled, right. like a heat map or sort of. Sure. Yeah. It does. You might be right. Yeah, I think that's what's that about. place. That's the this yacht. Is also, this is also where, where do these these journeys start from? Um, no, it could be kids riding to the club, like there's a lot of kids, like they have tennis lessons there. I've seen mm -hmm. kids riding the bikes, so it could be the tennis club. Yeah, uh, well, go ahead. That, that that gets to my point. A lot of the rides that go to those destinations are actually very short du duration. They're kids, they're families that are going to the Black Point Inn or to the club in Black Point, and that or in Pine Point, they're going from not from Route 1 to Pine Point, but from along East Grand Ave, from one point to another on, on East Grand Ave. Um, okay. So th that would dictate a different tra uh, bike planning process than if people are, you know, biking all the way up to Route 1 from Pine Point to go shopping at Dunstan. Yeah, I think that sort of nuance is really difficult to capture in yeah. the way that we collected this information um and that in general you know it's kind of a fine line between do you 
do you set something like this up or do you have a plan that aims to try and capture the very specific movements that are happening now or do we do it more generally which I think is kind of what they're getting at here which is okay we've got these big areas of residential um, intensity and they are they either capture within them destinations or there are um, a handful of destinations nearby and so therefore logic would say people would be traveling you know between this blob area and these few point destinations and then you look at how do we um, improve those sort of connections that's what i that's what i would take away from a, a map like this but um i'm curious if others think and i think that's why i think the having some sort of weight or scale to what we understand to be the destinations would be helpful um did they miss the bus route that goes to Walmart? Because like, there's a bus stop there. I see people waiting there, assuming it's for a bus. But, you know, it's right in that orange area up there. The gallery Boulevard. Mm, yeah. I think it's a different route than like the purple line is a, but it's a bus route. is a route, but you're right, there is another route that services. I don't know where it goes. Okay. <laughs> it's almost not one of my bits right in the Scarborough area. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. So, the, so, so this map here, this map here is where bikers or pedestrians go to the green dots. No. Well, this is where the people that came to the public meeting put dots that where they go and oh. where they're coming from. So you have the different neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at off the Broad Turn Road where, where the going. ballpark is yep. and, and the record. I mean, yeah. To me, that's that there's a whole bunch of homes out there. And you could actually ride a bike on those those roads because they're all in, a lot of them are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a trail that kind of connects the back of all those neighborhoods. Yeah, but well, I don't see anybody. We were there. trying to capture when we did this, we were trying to capture where people live because I think mean, Greg or Michael or somebody said, so where are these people coming from? Yeah. You know, and where is it they want to go? And I'm not sure that this really captures it yeah. in a way that's helpful because if um, you know, if I live uh, out off a of broad turn and where I want to go is to the library, which there's a dot at the library. This doesn't show that I want to get there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they need to add the groupings of homes on west of the turnpike too. They haven't yeah. added any of that. This kind of the draw. Of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I just kind of noticed it's probably just because where I live, but I don't think the west side of the highway was addressed in any. Oh, any I don't think so. It... Nobody goes there. Watch. I mean, it wasn't even like a comment on the. You have to have an open house. <laughs> on the like no, like bike lanes or wide yeah. shoulders or yeah. sidewalk. No, I don't think it was even. Yeah. It just cut the whole map off at the highway. No. Whole study. Maybe blow up the rest of them. Well, when the connector goes down, see if they can take that money. But to show you how things are connected, if you look uh, where Pleasant Hill Road is, there's two green dots and an orange dot there. Mm -hmm. the, the two green dots is the um, Pleasant Hill Preserve, and the other green dot is the, rec the recreational facility down there. Wow. The trouble is, I bet you anything where we live, no one sends their kids across Pleasant Hill Road. Okay. I did that today before I came here. <laughs> And it was terrifying. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's <laughs> but, a disconnect. But yeah. How like we can travel tonight. That's what I think. Um, yes. Well, let's see what the policy is. Try not to be selfish right. about it, but yeah, I agree yeah. with you. <laughs> because, but the reason for that is like I'm, I'm just, I'm one statistic, right? My family is one statistic. I live in a neighborhood that doesn't have its own park or recreation area, and the one closest to us. You know, there's a very busy road in yeah. between us and that, and where there's a whole bunch of other people and kids that, um, you know, that would logically make that transition. And and in reverse, on the other side, um, you know, there's a, a road in between another neighborhood and a school. So you know, that's another barrier. Um, but yeah, it's I think say that, that though, because on my side of town, I live by the Blue Point tennis courts. And then I'm also close, and I take the dog over by the um, 
the the there's a soccer fields and uh, baseball fields back on old Blue Point Road. I see kids all the time unsupervised on bikes going to both of those places, and they cross Route Nine. I mean, Route Nine's a not a fun road to cross. Um, old Blue Point Road is probably a little bit better, but it's twisty and it has it's it's got a lot of blind spots on it. Um, but parents are still sending their kids around those on those spots. So it's interesting that Pleasant Hill there's more um, reluctance. Maybe we just are more Darwinist over on our side of town. But I'm not <laughs> saying it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying it happens and it's scary. Oh, it is. No, it, 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 watching kids on bikes cross Route Nine on Blue on on, on Pine Point Road is yeah. it. It's right. not a good thing. So sidewalk on Route Nine. Yeah. And there isn't either of those on yeah. Pleasant Hill Road. Yeah, yeah. and it's probably busier. The trouble we have. Yeah. What we have in town is we just have too few significant on main roads. You know, we don't have a lot of interconnecting roads. Yeah. So then they get into talking about facility types, kind of as this, you know, um, selection of what they could uh, propose. Yeah, this so, is for, this is for Steve, right? Yeah. So they have the bike lanes, and then they have your conventional bike lanes. Um. And then they have There's this, no um, yeah. and then they have buffered bike lanes, which is what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, right there. Um, but what's really, then they have the bicycle neighborhood byways. I just felt on a lot of this, it tapped into um, a cut and paste that really was not well, taking into account. It, it is community. because in all of their recommendations, I don't think there's a cycle track recommendation. There's a lot of shared use path, but there's no description for what a shared use path is for. Mm -hmm. There's no description at all for- um, Or that even does a um, CAD CAM kind of thing. This takes a couple of our major roads like mm -hmm. one and says, here's something that you could do. Yeah. As opposed to this canned stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like a cross section, potential cross section. Right. Yeah. It's, and there's no there's no ped section in any of the facility types. There's no, you know, this is what a 10 foot sidewalk look, looks like. This is what a five foot sidewalk looks like with a five foot esplanade. Yeah. What's the point of an esplanade? Should it be back yeah. and curve? All that. Or so none should, of that was pathways. there. Because I'm a huge, I don't like esplanades because of the maintenance and the aesthetic but I like a different material in that space. Mm -hmm. So it keeps you out of that space as a walker. So you're saying not a grass. Aspect. Not a grass. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. For well, maintenance. That seems to me the other thing we have to keep in mind of in this community, there's no sidewalks for a reason. People don't want to pay the extra money for, for these things. I think there's no sidewalks well, for a reason because nobody made them do it. Well, <laughs> that could be, but I just think there'll be there be resistance to, you know, I think we have to be uh, smart about prioritizing where where we get the most. I don't think you'll find people arguing about sidewalks. I don't think, no, I think that's really think one, 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 think that's a lot of desire for that. And in certain areas, like yeah. not everywhere, yeah. Yeah. for sure. Yeah. Broad turn roads, probably not going to be near the top of any list for getting right. sidewalk. Yeah. But it's also not a commercial corridor and it doesn't have zoning for people but, that you know, walk to something. But it should perhaps have a different treatment than, you know, than what it has in yeah. order to make it safer. So there, the context is important. And I think, um, you know, I, I think there we have a lot of areas in town that do need an improvement. In some of those places, it's a sidewalk or something like a sidewalk, and in others, that that treatment just isn't. That's rail one. We need to have sidewalks on both sides. Yeah, the whole way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's, mean, I don't think anyone would argue it, that that that's a good you idea. You go out like in rural, it's Cumberland, then where North Yarmouth meets. North Yarmouth has built sidewalks on Route Nine. I think it's Route Nine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people are out there walking on yeah. it. It's the middle of nowhere. Yeah. But people, you know, so you it's know, a they, it's a priority. Yeah, so exactly. it's... sidewalks, you know, everyone they built in town, you see people on mm -hmm. yeah. where people used to be in the road. Yeah. So or not. Or not walking. walking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think one thing that, that wasn't recognized by the, the 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 report is that all of our major roads were laid out 250 years ago. 
um, the, the the pictures that they show are from towns and cities that are much more modern and were and, and in most cases post date the automobile. Um, but like Broad Turn Road has houses that are eight feet from the road from, from the roadway. Um, Black Point Road has houses that are eight feet from the roadway. Where where part of the challenge we'll always face is how do we take a two hundred and fifty year old thoroughfare and make it accessible for pedestrians and bikes in an era where cars move at 50 miles an hour. We don't have a time. I didn't get a context out of this report that would help us address some of those issues that are, are unique to Scarborough founded in the 16 whatevers. Yeah. And it's how to reduce those speeds. Right. Exactly. It's how, it's how to, you know, it might not be a new, you can't always add, right? To your point, Correct. like if you have a fixed right of way, or if you if you add, it's at the it's at the compromise of something else. Um, but you know, I think the the point that you're that you're approaching is that um, you know our roadways can be made safe for everyone in all modes of transportation, and but that might look different on different roadways. And that might be in, in some cases where there isn't physical space to add something new and safer, um, then the, the treatment and the recommendation should be different. And so, yeah, spoiler alert, the answer that I think you're you're looking for in, in cases um, where the roadway is fully built out, there isn't excess right of way and the traffic speeds are high such that it's deterring people from walking and biking. The answer is probably how do we reduce the speed so that everyone can safely, more safely coexist. You probably narrow the lanes because that's one of the ways. It's a, it's a whole other, it's a whole other toolbox of treatments, down. and they're well known and they're well practiced, and it's not rocket science. But yes, I think that's a good point that having those listed mm -hmm. out, like you might not think that narrowing lanes is a treatment for pedestrian safety, but it can be. Well, that's what yeah, they it, do. It, it, I'll do one in Donald Thomas, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that yeah. that's an example that we could possibly consider on Route One here. But I didn't find in these examples anything that that led me to yeah. even think about Falmouth. These were all more in a far more urban yeah. setting. And, and, yeah, um, that, that, that was my thing. The toolkit that they presented us with was was not the toolkit that we need for our town. I totally I get it that there is a set of tools we can use. But that's what should be to this document, not the ones that are relevant for Indianapolis. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then we get into bicycle traffic accommodations. So these are the destinations up at the top, and then the legend of what we have. And again, I think this one be a good breakout map. Yeah, so there's a lot see. going on here in a lot of colors. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of wonder. I'm curious as the rest of this group. Like at this point, on a graphic like this, do you? I I wonder if it maybe we don't. Um, maybe what the destination is is less important. So like the color differentiation between is it a bus stop or is it the Eastern mm -hmm. Trail? I'm not sure that matters. Whereas if it was just a dot, that would sort of help you focus more on the network part of it. Sure. Um, and then you'd be able to see, okay, whatever the destination is, we don't have a good way to get there. Or that destination has three different ways to get there. Um, so it looks like Black Point Inn has a bike rack. Could, could very well. I haven't been there long. It's been right right either that, or, so either that or a ballet who pops your bike for you. <laughs> Does this list the bike rack? Or is that different? No, I think no. that's the separate thing. No, bike racks. I started to do an inventory. Right, I thought. And I, we've, we've looked at that outside of this, I think, in yeah. a couple of other ways. I did see the bike tool thing over at the park wheel. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, for flats and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And we do have a bike rack at this campus. It's hidden in public safety behind the door. It took me forever to find it. I finally found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in the corner. Yeah. Well, and the and the one in the hub has finally been installed. Oh, nice. It was just okay. sitting there for the longest time, and now it actually is installed. <laughs> so when did you do that? <laughs> it was one of my midnight projects. <laughs> for that kind of reason. Uh, and so then we get into... Bicycle facility recommendations. 
And again, you get into very specific from location, um, priority, cost, ease of implementation. This is what we asked them because we're trying to get a cross reference matrix of, you know, is it a oh, vehicular, bicycle, ped, um, how we can do some of the projects together. Um, but again, like you see shared use path, shared use path, shared use path, and nowhere in this is a shared use path. I'm like, what the heck is a shared use path? Like, show me. I mean, I know what it is, but yeah, it's not it. You talked about what's it, time. what's a shared lane, what the share and signage look like. None of these things are in this part. Oh, we have shared use paths now, it's just a street. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so so oh. that that was some of my overarching comments. Um, they don't have a graphic to go with this either, do they? No mm -mm. I feel like that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I have exhibit showing these. Yeah, right. Where <laughs> are they? What is it? Yeah. Where are they? Because I don't know. I've showed them this map that exists where I, I've seen, I know they're here. It's basically your existing facilities with a white background, with colorful lines, and then the dotted for connecting yeah. the paths, right? So it's Portland, really simple. You can point them yeah. to Portland. Okay. That's a good example. Like, it's not well, Topsom had a really nice thing, too. Yeah. Topsom had a good one, and Yarmouth probably does, yeah. too. I mean, Actually, because it should combine the existing facilities that they've shown and sidewalks and all that, and then put these on there because they know where particularly with Topsom they took you know where the gaps were and they they pointed out whether yeah. this was a high knee gap yeah. a medium knee gap or a low knee gap um and it was again with a white background right color, so you, it was really easy. it's really easy just to visualize you don't need to see I don't need to see the parking lot underneath and that. nobody needs to print all these colors yeah right. I'm, not, I'm not sure on the aerial is um maybe like one or two graphics up front with an yeah. aerial at the back but after that, um, the satellite views are not particularly helpful. Yeah. Has anyone from the Bike Coalition weighed in on this? Mm -hmm. They might have like a local expert or something that might be have some knowledge. Of it. But I, I had another thought along those same lines, not necessarily for their input, but um, GPCOG, GPCOG's website has a huge amount of. Um, they have a great data, a GIS database that's available to the public. And I think that it's really user friendly and visually good, like easy to understand. Um, and they have all sorts of different data sets. But for example, mm -hmm. one of them is a regional, they have maps of regional trails and mm -hmm. um, bike map connections, maybe that's. Maybe I'm stretching the truth there, but definitely trails. <laughs> um, and I think it would be great at some point, and there's not a lot listed on it for um for Scarborough. Right. So some you know, Eastern Trails there and like some right. fun ones. But anyway, something along the lines of I just think it's frustrating or not a great use of anyone's time to re completely reinvent a wheel if it's not necessary. But if there was a way to for instance, merge those even something like that data sets together. Yeah, yeah like a cross like this stuff. Will. A cross section. <laughs> but yes, I think that um, having a an exhibit or map of these facility recommendations for both bike and head facilities. Um, would be helpful, you know, if John Anderson were here, I would have to believe that, you know, something that the council could quickly look yeah. at and say like, wow, we have a lot of work to do in the Dunstan area or right. wow, right. all of these projects are really widely spread all over town. Help us understand where we should prioritize first, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then just lastly, you know, when you have separate <laughs> tables for bicycles and pedestrians, um sort of inherently the opposite of what I understand the shared use path to be. Um, so you know, which category would those go in? And I do think in communities like ours, you know, it's not realistic to your point earlier, Peter, it's not realistic for us to expect five or six foot bike lanes and sidewalks in all the places that maybe they should be. Um, because we we just don't have the space for that. But a shared use path 
particularly for long stretches, mm -hmm. um, I think is a great, you know, it's a great recommendation and we should recognize that that's literally shared. It's a shared use. So that is with signage and should be suitable a... for bicycles and pedestrians and rollerbladers and strollers and right. whatever all else, all the things. Well, and I think it's realistic on that line too. To, to, there are there are corridors which are probably higher speed, i.e., more aligned for bikes and rollerbladers, but still valid for pedestrians. And there are plenty of corridors that are really valid more for pedestrians. And we should expect to have slowing features that would make it harder for a ten-speed biker to be zipping through at Tour de France speeds. Yeah. So, so understanding that a shared use path is not a singular concept. But is a range of shared of sharings of uses, I think is yep. fair for our town. But it should be better defined. Well, yeah, because I want to know what the materials are for a shared use path. Because sometimes shared use path conjures up it's crushed green, granite green, green, or it could yeah. be yeah. pavement or what is it? Oh, yeah. Back to Boulevard. Yeah. 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 And and that's and again, to me, that was what was lacking here. You had the 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 visual toolkits that were presented. Um, just were not as relevant as what we really could have gotten, which would have been a two-pager of what different shared use passes, pathways look like. Right. Based on the recommendations, that's all we really needed. Yeah, exactly. So it would have to be a picture, just be KPM or some kind of, you know, yeah. graphic design, but so a cut section. Okay. Um, I've also come across very recently some great resources, some old uh, guidebooks, which I haven't dug mm -hmm. into, but based on their title and a quick perusing of my own, that are really specific for rural environments. And we're maybe in that kind of in between gray area, yeah, yeah. but based on some of the um, the design concepts that are presented here, which definitely come off as a stronger urban treatment. Right. There may be some helpful um, suggestions, uh, terminology or definitions or what have you in some of these other okay. rural design guides. Like FHWA has two, I think, that would be relevant for rural to rural rural roadways. I can forward those to you. Okay. Do you guys want to talk about the appendix or just wait and see what we get back next time? It's wait. Um, I know we're we're a little bit over time just for this um for this topic, so I don't know if people have um comments or thoughts on the appendix itself. I thought we had some good input on maybe some base document things that should go yeah. into the appendix. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, I haven't had a chance to dig into this. I haven't dug into things, that so part really. Maybe not detail. I would say. Okay, great. Uh, any staff updates? Uh, so, so is this going to be in the final draft? So we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send them the comments over that we talked about, um, so they can incorporate it for the next draft. Okay. <clears throat> While well, we're talking about it, mm -hmm. September 21st. I just said, yeah. Is that that accurate because I sent Angela um, when when we got this email. I said, Are you sure? It's Saturday. It's, oh, what is the email? Twenty one. It's the Wednesday. Oh, the Wednesday. Okay. Wednesday. Oh, the for the workshop. Oh, for the workshop. Yeah. Oh, it's the eighteenth. Yeah, it's a big late time council meeting yeah. workshop. How do you know that? So we have that. Um, I don't really have any other updates, I don't think. For so, for the record, because we're being uh, 
recorded and broadcasted here. The what Roger is alluding to is um a workshop. Has that been has that been um scheduled? Is that a go? Do you know? I do not know. Okay. No, we, we don't know. There's a tentative works workshop scheduled with the Maine Turnpike Authority and the Maine Department of Transportation in our Scarborough Town Council and town committees to be determined, but I would presume this committee would be mm -hmm. among those. Um, we had received an email that stated that workshop would be September 21st. The date was incorrect, so we're thinking that it would be September 18th, um, but and I just completely speaking for you, but that will be confirmed. So yes, we'll confirm that. For we will you. confirm. Okay, great. And that would be to go over um, the East West bypass project. Correct. Is that the meeting of the town council? Yes. Yes. The idea. Maybe this is an out of school question, but. When you say they will go over the east west connector, I've read or have seen a lot of a wide range of information about where we stand right now, especially with the change of leadership at the top of the MTA and and other things. Do we know even what that might look like in broad strokes at this point? Or I think that's the idea of the workshop. Right. <laughs> I think there are a lot of questions that a lot of different people have posed to our council. And so council, you know, we created this memorandum of understanding what, 12 years ago or so. Um, and so really trying to make sure that we have a good understanding of what's actually happening. I think council is um, wanting to ensure that. And they're wanting to lean on some of the committees for some different perspectives as well, like Conservation Commission, um, Transportation, so. But I don't have a, this was actually, Angela's work um, email was actually the first I had heard about the date actually maybe being tentative, so I'm not sure yet. Okay. Um, because I'm, I'm used to a lot of these workshops having um, sort of a theme that everyone's aware of before you walk in the door, and this one feels mm -hmm. less like that. I think there's a theme. <laughs> I think um, you could probably watch some of the council meetings, like the public comment section, and get a feel for. So for from Scarborough's perspective, I bias. It's from the MTA's perspective. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to come with. Oh, I I don't know. I yeah. It's part of the whole thing too. Oh, we don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the part that seems We're more. Curious. We're curious. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have a few minutes for public comment. Um, hi, everyone. I have some of the episodes you guys. I'm here to talk about the Gorm connector. So no. it's a good. Uh, a really nice <laughs> yeah, a good um, transition. Thanks. Welcome. Um, and have a lot of information here, so I'm going to try to go uh, quickly. Will you introduce yourself? But my name is Stanis Moody Roberts. I live at 38 County Road, and I'm right in the path of the proposed uh, turnpike. Um, but I'm trying here to just stick to data and not be as biased as I clearly am, um, having this potentially coming through uh, my home. Um, but just to quickly respond to what Peter had been asking. Um, I think where this, the idea of this workshop, um, the town council had has been working on a motion to potentially um, uh, challenge the MTA's current proposal. And the MTA and, and main DOT requested a workshop before they, they um, consider that motion. And it was therefore proposed for um, September 18th, uh, which is a town council meeting. So there'd be a regular workshop, MDOT, MTA workshop, 5.30 to, to 7, and then the town council meeting uh, at 7, where they potentially would be considering that motion. Um, but I printed out a whole bunch of information here um, and data here. The first page is 
a chart of AADTs, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, uh, average annual uh, daily traffic, which is a value that um, averages out your uh, your <laughs> daily traffic um, to give a single value that's reflective of an entire year. Um, and I didn't cherry pick any of this. Uh, there's several sites that are available um, on Main DOT's website and then in their archives that go back all the way to 1996, uh, which are traffic counts that MDOT has done during that year and then turn that traffic count into an AADT value. And what this shows is that traffic on this entire corridor peaked between 10 and 20 years ago and is down on average 15% from that peak. Um, and you can follow I've grouped them into Route 22 east of the overlap, Route 14 uh, south of the overlap, Running Hill, uh, the overlap itself, and then um, two points uh, on 22 and 114 west of the overlap, which is in Gorham. Um, and throughout that corridor, this trend is apparent. And what I'd also want to point out is that 114 and 22 do not have particularly high AADTs. Um, we have an AADT of around 8,500 on Route 22 um, east of the overlap, and we have an AADT of around 11,500 on 114, going um, going up to about 14,000 at the overlap intersection. Uh, Running Hill is an AADT of uh, 5,700. Um, and the overlap is a less than a mile stretch where you have this um, greater traffic volume because you have the two routes uh, coming together, um, which is around uh, 21 to 22,000. And uh, that um, stretch in comparison, uh, Route 1 is about 30,000, uh, where Route 1 goes through um, here in, in Scarborough. And for another comparison, uh, we look at I looked at Black Point Road, which many of you are familiar. Black Point Road has a higher AADT between Highland Avenue and Route 1 than Route 114 or Route 22. Wow. And it's been trending upwards. Um, it didn't peak 10 to 20 years ago. It, it's on a an upward trajectory. So that's a good comparison when we're talking about traffic on 114 22. <laughs> um, I go into why this is, but in a nutshell, it's because even though there's been growth in Warren, Standish, Buxton, and uh, in those Western areas, that growth demographically has been in the older population. Um, look at the difference in growth between 2010 and 2020 in those in Warren, Standish, and Buxton. It grew by 7.8%, but demographically, the age group between 18 and 64 only increased by 422, while 65 plus increased by over 2,000. So you have a aging population that is working less and commuting less, and that is in addition to the trend of uh, some office workers working from home. And another example of this is looking at uh, student enrollment in uh, the Bonnie Eagle School District, which is Standish, Boston, Haas, and Lemington. It peaked in 2006 at um, 4,111 district-wide, and now in 2023, it's down to 3,300. So it's a substantial reduction in population, and the trend is that that will continue. We're in an aging state, um, particularly in the more rural areas. And uh, Maine's birth rate right now, um, or fertility rate, is uh, 1.47, where your replacement rate is 2.1. And so the only reason the state right now is growing is because of in-migration. And uh, demographically, they uh, or population-wise, the main state economist has economic projections for every single town, uh, um, demographic projections, which show that growth in this entire area by 2040 will reach its peak. Um, so the next page is from the MTA. It's a uh, graphic that shows if the connector was built, how would traffic shift? 
And it looks really impressive. There's a lot of blue lines here, which is reduction. Um, but when you look at the actual values, it's really not impressive at all. I put a chart below that shows the Based on this map, it doesn't give you an exact value of change, it just gives you a range. But if you take the mid-range point, it shows uh, Route 22 in Scarborough is actually would grow by 1.8%. It doesn't reduce at all. And one of the town's arguments for this connector is that it would reduce traffic in North Scarborough Village. North Scarborough Village is where 22 goes through. It doesn't, according to this map. It, it, shows that it reduces it further down with the overlap in that South Forum, but not in North Scarborough. Um, but your, your average de decreases, which occur on Running Hill, Beach Ridge, Broad Turn, um, and potentially Route 1. Route 1 has a difference of a half a percentage, which is just a statistical error. Um, and Running Hill, it shows a 6.6% reduction, Beach Ridge, 5.9% uh, 6, 6, uh, reduction, Broad Turn, a 4.1% reduction. That's not a very big value in the grand scheme of things. Um, and furthermore, Running Hill would have a toll-free interchange to 295. Um, so anyone who doesn't want to pay a toll who's coming from 114 or 22, is going to go down Running Hill and get on the 295 that way. Um, so the idea that Running Hill would have a reduction is, I think, really far-fetched when you take that into account. Um, the next page is also from the MTA. It's from their land use study where they had an independent study done that mapped out uh, your difference in well, they mapped out it, whether or not the Gorm connector would cause sprawl. And they came to the conclusion that it would not cause sprawl, but that was because the biggest driver of whether or not it would cause sprawl is how much improvement it adds to, uh, to commuting time. And it shows here, they picked a random spot. Well, not really random. They picked a spot, which is at the main mall, that is a node of employment. And they mapped out all possible uh, routes from that node of employment of commuting. And they looked just at 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. during weekdays. And they found that with the Gorm connector, the maximum time savings would be four minutes. And that would be just for West Gorham, North Buxton, and uh, Standish. And everywhere else, have Bux, the rest of Buxton has about a zero to one minute um, improvement and everywhere else doesn't improve at all. So it's it's incredibly little savings. And I'd argue that this actually underestimates the savings that people would have in order to prove what they're trying to prove, which is that there wouldn't be sprawl, but it shows the discrepancy in data that the MPA has. Um, the next page is, from JP Cog, it's a heat crashes map, which shows your areas where there are greater amounts of, uh, of vehicle crashes um, throughout this region. And I circled the, the North Scarborough South Gorham area from 95 to, um, to the Gorham Bypass. And it's not atypical from anywhere else. You see your, your high crashes are obviously in your more urban areas. Um, but all the other smaller routes are have the same amount of blue at intersections. So there's not a there's no greater danger on Route 22 and Route 114, which is a point that has been um, brought up as a reason for this connector. Um, but it's not it's not something that's that the data really shows as being a concern. Um, and then final couple pages. Um, the first page here is the MTA did an alternatives analysis, uh, which they said showed that it was impractical to, to um, do an existing roads improvement uh, and that a new road was necessary. And how they did this was they compared 
they used a 76 foot roadway as your widened roadway, um, which is two 16 foot lanes, a 12 foot median, and then two more 16 foot lanes, which is basically equivalent to 295. And they placed that in along uh, all of 114 or all of the overlap 114 and Running Hill or the overlap in all of 22 and said, this is your only other option. Um, and of course it impacted uh, many houses along the way. Um, but it's not what your only option is. And the last page is an example of, if you were to do, to even build four lanes, when you're using 11 foot roadways, your four lanes add up to 44 feet. And if you have even great six foot wide shoulders on either side, that still only adds up to uh, 56 feet. You have a 66 foot right of way along this entire section. Um, but you don't even, the only place you might need to widen according to these AADTs is that less than a mile overlap stretch. And um, the trend now is to, instead of doing a four lane road to do a three lane road, which is two lanes and then a turning lane between because single lanes actually have quite a bit of carrying capacity. It's your intersections and when people stop and need to wait to turn where you end up um, really slowing things down. And the three lane roadway, which is the picture, which could be what our um, overlap could look like is um, can be, can really fit in with a village um, idea of an area. And uh, it all goes to show that there's quite a lot that we can do to improve our existing roadways before we have to take the step to build a, a new turnpike such as the Gordon Center proposal that we have not done yet. And with our traffic declining on this corridor, it is really hard to justify um, the Gordon Center. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And yes, do you have any questions? What's your name again? Stanis. Stanis, S T A. That's my first name. Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's Stan. Oh, yeah. Um, when you were here last, you talked about three roundabouts. Yes. And I, the reason I'm thinking about that is I think that's what our last guest had. We talked about roundabouts and high crash locations. Yeah. Right. And I'm looking at this here. Are you familiar with the roundabout out of um, by uh, Costco? Um, by Costco. Costco Road Downs. Scarborough Downs Road. You know I'm not. I okay. haven't uh, driven much to uh, Scarborough Downs okay. since it, it opened with the development. Well, I'm just yeah, I'm just wondering whether something like this, you know, um, and I'll say it out the bike things. <laughs> but um <laughs> Oh, what's that about? <laughs> but just to, just to get just to get the roundabout, you know. So yes, there's three intersections, really two roundabout. major ones on either side of the overlap that need no, improvement. And it would be yeah, obviously Street really, one fourteen. Yeah, twenty two and Saco Street. Right. Yeah, and then where twenty two meets um Stuff or yeah. Yeah. No head and head there are many different ways that you can improve those two intersections. One could be to just go convert into round. Down. Well, listen to that down there. The other would be to add turning lanes to, um, to what we're doing in Scarborough, but is there's no plan to do right now in Gorham, um, which is to put in adaptive signals, which they just did route one as well. Um, and they're in the process of doing that uh, in North Scarborough too. Um, but but yeah, there there certainly are ways to improve those intersections better than they are now. Well, the last thing I'll say is I will compliment you on this because this is easier to understand than that. Than just to... <laughs> exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm working on a. I just started working on a website to try to put all the data um, together, so then you can. Um, and it'll have links to everything, so that you can. Hey, you're uh, successful here. Yeah. Uh, you should go to the Middle East. And get <laughs> hey autumn uh, a quick question autumn will, will we is our policy would we publish this on the website um as part of our public comment section 
I didn't get a copy of it, so I'd love to get a copy of it. But um, uh, the oh, I can. I I'm wondering what are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, yeah. do would we, when provided with information like this, would we would then um, provide it with our minutes or whatever? Um, Stan, if you would give me an extra copy, I'll see Peter at Long Range Planning. Well, so will you, Adam. We yeah, can, we can just give you one. We normally, yeah. I don't, we don't get I think it's out. our practice to put the attachments, but okay, just just asking. So I, I don't, yeah. I don't know. We'll get you a copy, Peter. Cool, thank you. We'll definitely get you a copy. <laughs> I wrote on mine, so I'll have to ask you for <laughs> three more ideas. Okay. okay, well, we'll take an extra one, we'll get it to Peter. <laughs> That's nice that you included bike lanes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Twenty-two is probably the worst road uh, right now. There's oh. a uh, commuter corridor that does not have any uh, bike lanes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.